Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. Coming to you from sunny Honolulu and the first state in the nation that declared the goal of 100% clean energy. If any of you out in the audience has not figured this out yet, I have figured it out. I am not leaving this planet alone, or I should say alive. And since I know I'm going to be going at some point, I had gosh darn well better hand any wisdom I can, I can to the younger generation. And boy, do we have the younger generation with us today. Two students from Iolani School, very, very active in the Climate Future Forum. Lisa Kuharik and Audrey Lin. They actually appeared on this program a year ago, and they have been going, I guess, nonstop ever since. And we just, at least I am very inspired by them. I think anybody in the audience will be too. The future is in good hands with young ladies like this being very, very active out there in the community. So Lisa, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and then about what you're going to talk about and launch us into the program. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Howard, for having uh, me and Audrey in this show. It's amazing to be back, uh, bringing more information about the Climate Future Forum and the results of how it ends up going. So yeah, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Um, so a little bit about myself. I'm, a current, I'm currently a junior at Yolani School. I am originally from Ukraine, but it's my second year here in Hawaii already. And I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunity to be able to get involved um, in the youth advocacy and also in the climate change movement, because it is something that I used to be doing in Ukraine as well. So again, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be able to do this here in Hawaii as well and be able to promote the youth empowerment and youth advocacy uh, on the state level while I'm here. Um, so moving to the main topic of our presentation today is the Climate Future Forum that happened December 9th this year. Oh, already last year. Well, technically this again every year is it's still school for us. Um talking a little bit more about how it all went. We had around 80 participants, the same around the same amount of people that we had last year. That was an amazing combination of people that we were able to see. There are people coming from different schools, also people coming from different islands. It was truly amazing to see all youth uniting around the same idea of the youth advocacy and climate action. Uh, the whole purpose of the event, Climate Future Forum, is to um, create this bridge between youth and the legislative system here in Hawaii with the mission of, again, empowering youth voices in climate policy. And we hope that our attention to this topic will call the legislature accountable for the impactful legislation. Uh, so moving to the next slide, I will talk a little bit more about the structure of the event that we had. We had five different groups uh, that tackled different policy areas where students were able to participate. Um, I was leading one of them, so just in a minute, I will target specifically uh, one of these groups, and then Audrey will also present the group that she was helping um, helping to lead. Um, but generally speaking about the, um, the event that we were able to organize, we had the Sustainable Infrastructure and Development Policy Group that students were able to join that is particularly focused on planning and developing sustainable communities with clean our infrastructure. We also had the group on clean energy and transportation. This is actually the area that I am most interested in and that I was helping to lead. So I'll also get back to it just in a minute to talk more about the results that we received out of this, um, the conversation and the discussion that we had in our group on clean energy and transportation. It was primarily based on increasing accessibility for cleaner energy and transportation for people he here in Hawaii. Um, another group that we were, um, that we were having in our event is the climate and economy that mainly focused on correcting the market failures of the unsustainable economy and working towards transitioning um, to the sustainable one. And we also targeted the area of regenerative food systems, which is incredibly 
important, especially here in Hawaii, being so highly dependent on the imports um, from other countries and the mainland. It mainly was focused on the reducing food waste and transitioning food systems towards more sustainable ones, as like reliance on the more locally produced food. Um, and the last one is the time of justice and just transition. While we acknowledge the fact that the transitioning, the soul transitioning to the more sustainable development is the core of um, what we want as youth to advocate for, it is also important to ensure that this transition to the sustainability is equitable for um, everyone. And we also want to work towards reducing the burden of on marginalized communities and uplifting them so they, we are also able to share their voices and hear from their perspective. Um, yeah, so now I'm moving towards uh, the group that I was more closely working with as the clean energy and transportation, the one that you can see on the next slide. Um, talking a little bit more about the importance of it, it really affects us on a daily basis. If you think about it, we use the electricity, we use transportation every single day to commute to different places. Um, we use electricity to do our homework, homework on a daily basis. We all, in our school, we have iPads that we use every single day and we do need electricity in order to be able to charge them as well. And um, it is something that really affects us on a daily basis and it is one of the reasons why I decided to join this group particularly. Um, with my group, we focused on two different aspects of it. First one is the clean energy and the second one is the transportation sector. Um, so talking more specifically about what kind of policies used in Hawaii, things are more important to prioritize under the clean energy and transportation sections. Um, for the clean energy priorities would be the solar panels on the newly constructed homes. Also the Hawaii Home Energy Assistance Program that is highly promoted by the Blue Planet Foundation that was helping me with uh, organizing and uh, leading this workshop for the students during the Climate Future Forum. Um, also, students in my group um, found that the bill, SB 1154, that was, well, that's its number in the previous legislative session, but it is still, it is still promoted in the new legislative session um, about the continuous emissions moni monitoring, which is incredibly important for the research that is conducted in this area. And also, it's really important to realize what kind of emissions are actually being in the air and in order to be able to target them specifically in order to reduce them and increase the overall health um, conditions of people and um, lead, going towards the transition, the transportation priorities. It is the HP uh, 199 bill about the zero emissions vehicle purchasing assistance, which is also highly important. Um, also in my group, students really we're really passionate about the transportation system as, as the whole, the public transportation system that is really not as developed here in Hawaii, especially comparing to some other um, like big cities on the mainland or some some countries who um, like European countries, for example, where we're talking about some specific examples like in Denmark or Norway, when the transportation systems, the public transportation systems are really highly developed. And it is also something that here youth um, in Hawaii find really important. And we also talked about the zero emission school bus mandate as most of the people who are participating um, participating in the Climate Future Forum were school students. And it was really interesting to see how they found it really important. Um, yeah, so that was, that was on my part. I was really, really honored to be able to participate in Climate Future Forum and specifically in this um, in this crew course and also be able to work with a Blue Planet, Planet Foundation with Griff, who is the director of the um, education program there. It was an incredible opportunity for me and I'm really happy to be able to share with you the priorities that youth in Hawaii find mo most important. Elisa, let me pose a couple of uh, questions to you. I was in yeah. Hong Kong a few years ago and it is a jam-packed city, millions and millions of people in high-rise after high-rise, and yet there's no big traffic jams. Things are moving along smoothly. What is going on here, 
you go into any convenience store with a little transportation card and you tell the clerk, I want X dollars in transportation funding. And he just goes, zoop, zoop. And you've got your card. You hop onto a bus. You point the card at a little machine. It goes, and you're on the bus. And then in Hong Kong, there's ferries. You get off the bus. You go to the ferry. You go, beep. And you're on the ferry ride, and there's trains. Get off the ferry to the train station, beep, beep, and you're on the train again. What if Honolulu's or Hawaii's public transportation system were as efficient and as easy as that? When your card is running low, you get a boop, boop, boop sound. You go to the next convenience store. Boop, I want X dollars more. Boop, you got it. It's uh, really, really, really simple, and the buses are running all the time. The ferries are running all the time. And that's one big reason why you can fit millions of people into a small space, and everybody's getting along, getting around fine. But what's your re reaction to that? Yes, it is exactly what we were talking about. We were looking at some other models from other countries and how they are dealing with uh large populations and all the transportation systems and how they are incorporating this in order to achieve greater sustainability. And I really agree with you that the more developed public transportation system could really affect the way people commute to different places and also can reduce, significantly reduce the traffic. Uh, during my research on this topic, I was also interviewing some of just like random people uh, that, and I was just like hearing their stories and asking them how often they're using cars and what I learned is that they indeed use a lot cars really often because it is simply taking them too long to commute to different places with bus systems. Um, buses are not going to all the places on the island. Buses are also taking a really long time to go to different places. And there is just no significant amount of them that are on the road currently. Also, another aspect is that because it is not as common and there is a lot of the like sort of car culture that has been developed historically in the United States, I feel like it would be a really it, it would be a really hard and maybe even long transition towards the more like public transportation system and just like usage of those sort of common common goods because people are so used to be living really far away from the cities and just like going there in order to, for example, shop or go to school or um just like do any other activities and they're used to use cars for all of this. And from interviewing different people, I really learned that it is a, a really like big uh, sort of custom that they have. It's like a tradition that they have. And um, I, I believe that it is a really great idea that you pointed out um, with the development of more sort of connected transportation system. However, I do understand that it might be a really hard transition and it might take a really long time. You know, one of the benefits of traveling to other countries is to see yes. how public transportation oriented they are and how easy and cheap they make it compared to America and I might say Canada also. You use the word car culture. That's exactly what we have. So here's a just a, we need to leave you pretty soon and get to Audrey, but here's a simple proposition that I have heard for Honolulu. What if we just made the bus free? You can hop on the bus, hop off the bus anytime you want. What would happen then? In, I believe it might be a good idea. I can also see how there might be some controversies with this because there still has to go some funding towards how the bus will be operating and also people who will be like helping this bus to operate. So I definitely see how there might be some sort of negative sides of it, but I definitely can can see how this can also be a good idea because more people could potentially use it. And especially what I mentioned at the very beginning, the the sole idea, the core idea of why I decided to join is because a lot of low income communities are being um affected by this specifically because people simply don't have that much money in order to afford cars that are more sustainable and also don't have enough money to just simply be able to commuting really easily from one places to other places. And I believe that this, this idea could definitely benefit.
Why, why is beyond your years, Lisa? Now, Audrey, let's have the pleasure of hearing from you. Please introduce yourself a bit, a little bit of your background, why you joined the forum, and what your specialty is going to be today. Sure. Um, thank you so much, Howard, for having me, and thank you so much for Lisa for that wonderful presentation. Uh, my name is Audrey Lin. I'm a junior at Aelani School. I'm 17 years old, and I'm a co-founder of the Climate Future Forum, and I also help lead um, the Citizens Climate Lobby Hawaii Action Team, uh, which focuses on the policy group I'll be talking about today, which is titled Climate and the Economy. Um, and I am joined by Dr. Paul Bernstein um, from UH um, Economic Research Organization. Um, and our legislative sponsor is Representative Carl Rhodes. And um, I was fortunate enough um, to um, have them both attend the recent December event. Um, and I'd love to share more about the policy priorities um, that arose from our discussions. So if we could just share um, the slides. So our policy group um, was titled Climate in the Economy. And it's honestly just a wonderful reminder of how interdisciplinary the climate sector is. Um, and this policy group um, tries to kind of forge this bridge between economics and sustainability. Um, so one thing we tried to do for our participants um, was just to give them an introduction of basic economic principles and see how that tied to any climate-related bills. So the most widely supportive policy that um, our group discussed was called carbon cashback. And we've discussed this on your show before, Howard, but as youth, we truly believe it's our generation more than any other generation that will experience, honestly, the extraordinary cost and impacts of climate change. And as we see the influx of, you know, natural disasters um, and, and extreme weather, the most effective way to change our direction is to make the price of fossil fuels, um, which contributes to greenhouse gas emissions and then contributes to global warming, reflect the actual costs that they are causing, which would be a huge incentive for the economy to then shift to renewable energy. And a carbon cashback bill will do exactly this. So the carbon cashback um, was in the last legislative session as SB1004 and HB1146. And those bills would basically tax fossil fuel corporations and then compensate consumers, which would better enable Hawaii's transition to renewable energies. And we also researched how, um, you know, studies have shown how carbon cash bag result would result in a 10% reduction in carbon emissions in a revenue neutral manner. And in addition, our group discussed subsidies, whether that's on solar panels, electric vehicles, um, or some sort of regenerative food um, agriculture system. And that money would kind of be tiered based off of income. Um, and honestly, in Hawaii, um, we are so lucky to be blessed by just such an abundance of the land. And we really see how our, the indigenous populations truly treasured and protected um, the aina. Um, and now we kind of see the effects of climate change that are really omnipresent in every sector of the population from, you know, increased sea levels um, to severe weather to impacts on our economy and our daily lives. Um, and these, you know, policy priorities are just one way um, we see that our action um, can kind of drive political um, power um, and we want real systemic change within our legislature to save our future. And without the passage of the bills that I mentioned previously, the situation will only worsen. And to be frank, we're not really pleased with how um, our state looks right now. So we would like to see, you know, such change occur in the next legislative session. So on the next slide, um, we kind of talk about the next step of Climate Future Forum after our December event. And it's really wonderful to say that our work has not been unnoticed. Uh, recently, I was invited along with one of my peers, Raina. Um, we were invited by Senator Gabbard and Representative Lowen to speak at the January 11th climate briefing at the state capitol. Um, and the purpose of that was really to alert the people um, of the immediacy and magnitude of the threat that climate change poses to Hawaii. And also we wanna note that 
The legislative session has just begun and we are so excited to continue tracking bills, um, which we will hope to post on our website um, and sort of continue to testify um, for bills that matter to us so that we can really see um, our words and our productive dialogue change into momentum and inspire the rest of the nation and the rest of the world to follow suit. So very good. Oh, go, oh well, yeah. Let, so sorry. Let, let me. I'll. I'll just give your voice a, a guess for a moment. Yeah. Thank you so much. Regarding uh, climate change, the headlines in the news day after day are about all the immediate problems that we're having. A uh, couple of wars, very controversial election, and so forth. They are, as we say in Hawaii, manini, very small. The 800 pound gorilla that not enough people are paying to, paying attention to today is climate change. And it is, it's, we're having beautiful weather in a way as usual. We're not seeing it except for the Maui fire, but we will see it in our daily lives time after time. Look over the world, drought, flooding, fires, and so forth. So you're absolutely right in uh, focusing on that. Just just want to commend both of you for getting your priorities straight. So so please proceed. Yeah, no, Howard, you touched on a good point. And, um, you know, it, at Climate Future Forum, we like to use this thing called a climate story, which um, we like to share with legislators. We like to share, um, you know, with community members um, and other, you know, climate related groups and, of course, young students. But it's really a time to share how climate change has impacted you firsthand. Um, and you mentioned the Maui fires, um, and many of our, you know, students and participants mention, you know, devoting, you know, time after school to help volunteer um, for the Maui fires. Um, and for me personally, I grew up in California, and one of the most, you know, defining moments in my journey as a climate activist was the California wildfires. Um, which happened especially during the COVID pandemic. Um, and it was really, really, you know, incredible to see um, how the effects of climate change can just affect me firsthand. And with the Lahaina wildfires, we see that amplified um, at such a, you know, a local and granular level. Um, and another thing, I know Lisa likes to talk about this, but it is, you know, the butterfly effect. It's really what we do on a state level, what we do on a local level will, you know, kind of resonate, um, hopefully with the, at a national level or even in other states, um, or even around the globe. So we hope that what one movement, what's one, you know, youth led movement, um, in Hawaii can then have such a bigger impact, um, on such a larger scale. You know, I participate in climate change related activities at the national level. And it's, well, I always wear an Aloha shirt to, to these events so they can immediately spot me. But they say to a man or a woman, Hawaii is leading the way. We look to Hawaii for leadership. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, we, we have one of the most ambitious renewable portfolio standards um, in the entire nation. We want to be net zero by 2045. Um, and, you know, it's amazing that we're making those commitments. And now we want to see, you know, that follow up, which is, you know, those legislative changes, those bills, that legislation um, to begin to be passed so that we can, you know, adequately say that, yes, we've met those goals and we want the rest of the nation to follow. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lisa, you mentioned the word power when you referred to legislative activities. And I see it firsthand is part of my job where we think we are on the right track. We uh, just, we have irrefutable evidence about climate change and we're promoting different actions. And yet we get what we call pushback. And that pushback is very, very powerful. It persuades legislators because those people giving the pushback really know 
the legislative process, and they play the legislature like Yehudi Mendelwin plays the violin. So I'm really pleased that you two and your comrades are getting into the legislature. The more time you spend there, the better you understand the system, and the better you know how to pull the levers of power. That makes me very, very pleased. So we've only got uh, less than three minutes to go. So give us some uh, wrap-up wisdom here, either Lisa or Audrey. Well, I can mention one thing that um, I discussed in my policy group that I would love to share with your guests, um, which was kind of going with what you just mentioned, actually. Um, but it's the importance of cooperation. I think we've mentioned in our talk that, you know, climate change is such an interdisciplinary um, intergenerational movement. Um, and there's so many different stakeholders um, that we need to work together to sort of garner the support of all these different parties through compromise and then also productive dialogue. So then we can kind of reach across the aisle and um, see, you know, productive change occur. Um, Lisa, do you want to add anything to that? I think you're muted. You're, you're muted, Lisa. I'm so sorry. I was saying that I really agree with you, Audrey. And I also need to point out something that you forward mentioned about how important just the fact that we are trying it is because it is very important to realize, like what you mentioned, there is a really tight interconnection between different stakeholders and being a young person and willing to make this change. It's all about just making sure that your voice is being heard. And what we are trying to do is to encourage and give them this opportunity to as many youth as possible to make, to be able to do this and then just trying and trying and trying and just not giving up and not trying to, and not paying attention to all the pushbacks that you Hobart mentioned is something that makes this effort and this action so unique. Therefore, just like as a last word, I wanted to encourage everyone um, in Hawaii, in other states also internationally to never give up in terms of advocacy and just the effort of trying to make your voice heard because it's the the most important thing. So thank you so much. Beautiful. Yeah. So our time is up, but I want to thank both of you. And uh, I think uh, Mr. Bernstein has arranged for more of you to be on the program next week and the week after that. So I'm really, really looking forward to that. And I Highly, highly commend both of you, and you have a beautiful future. And that does it for Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. See you next time.